The Tin Tin Tripods are the tripods that appeared in Tin Tin Magazine in 1946. I haven't seen a lot of people talk about these ones, they're one of the more obscure and unknown fighting machine depictions. But they're basically what happens when a post-World War II comic book creator illustrates the War of the Worlds. When I initially encountered a picture of them, I felt they were a very odd looking design. My first reaction to seeing them was, oh hey, someone took the album Kaheya tripods and squished them really hard. But I think that's just the impression this particular image gave, due to the eyes being highlighted, when in reality they're actually quite different, usually being far darker. They were illustrated by Belgian writer and artist Edgar Felix Pierre Jacobs, more commonly known as Edgar or E.P. Jacobs, who, as it happens, would have turned 120 years old on the day this video is published, so happy birthday. It was his childhood friend, fellow Belgian artist Jacques van Melkebeke, who advised Jacobs to read the novels of H.G. Wells, in particular The War of the Worlds, which fascinated him. The works of the British writer became Jacobs' favourite bedside books. Consequently, it seems quite likely, considering the similarities, that he would have come across Cahaya's illustrations for the Belgian edition in 1906, although I believe that was a highly limited deluxe edition, so it's possible that that's not the case, but perhaps the artwork was seen elsewhere. Before working in comic books, Jacobs actually worked in many different fields, primarily focused around his love of the opera, doing odd jobs such as decoration, scenography, and even being an extra, and simply anything to get closer to it. It was his desire to be renowned as a baritone singer, and he even won an annual Belgian Government Medal for Excellence in Classical Singing in 1929. However, the Great Depression that that same year meant he didn't garner much wealth despite this. In May 1940, Jacobs was briefly mobilised in the army, when Belgium was invaded by Germany during World War II. This only lasted for 18 days, however, before the country surrendered and he was demobilised, although his brother was killed in one of the first battles of the invasion. In order to make money and having previously done small drawing commissions, having drawn as far back as his memory would go, he permanently turned to illustration as his primary career, joining children's weekly comic magazine Bravo in December 1940, where he would work on another well-known science fiction icon. Bravo had carried a translated version of the American comic strip Flash Gordon, however, after the United States declared war on Germany in 1941, Flash Gordon was banned in German-occupied Belgium. As a result, Jacobs was tasked with writing a final Flash Gordon serial, or Fake Gordon, to provide an end to the comic for Belgian readers that would no longer get to experience it. However, the Germans also banned this continuation after a couple of weeks. In response to this, Jacobs created his first original published comic strip, Le Rayon U, or translated to English, The U Ray which was basically a Flash Gordon ripoff, or that's how some put it from what I understand, but Jacobs made it his own, meaning it as a result was still very unique and different from what it was heavily based on, and is itself historically important as the earliest Belgian science fiction comic. It was also during World War II that he took a job being a stage painter for a theatre adaptation of the adventures of Tintin story Cigars of the Pharaoh, which brought him into contact with the creator of the series and fellow Belgian artist Hergé. The two quickly became friends, with Jacobs going on to become Hergé's first collaborator, initially using his innovative use of colour to redraw new versions of many of the original black and white Tintin comics, and would later go on to draw and contribute to the storyline of further new Tintin volumes. Hergé would actually make many references to Jacobs in The Adventures of Tintin, including him having a cameo 
cameo appearance in the new version of Cigars of the Pharaoh, as well as saying he outright based a large part of the personality of Captain Haddock on Jacobs. After the war, Belgian comic book publisher Raymond Leblanc approached Hergé with the proposition of creating a new illustrated youth magazine, which he'd concluded that Tintin would be the perfect hero for, considering he was already a very well-known character. After consulting with Jacobs, Hergé agreed and Leblanc recruited E.P. Jacobs as part of the team working on the project. The first issue of this new publication, Tintin Magazine No. 1, was released on the 26th of September 1946, inside which included, along with new Tintin adventures, the first part of a shortened version of The War of the Worlds, illustrated by Jacobs. Considering it's been said he was a long-time fan of the story, I could imagine that perhaps including this was his suggestion. Jacob's adaptation of H.G. Wells' novel featured on the cover and would continue to be serialised until its conclusion in the 16th issue on the 17th of April 1947. However, going back to Tintin No. 1 for a moment, it's worth noting that this wasn't the only piece of Jacob's work to feature in this particular issue, as it would actually turn out to be a very significant publication in his career, as it also featured the first ever comic of Blake and Mortimer, a detective science fiction comic series created by Jacobs for which he would become famous and most well known for. Inspired by H.G. Wells as well as Sherlock Holmes author Arthur Conan Doyle, the series features a British scientist and an MI5 agent who would face many enemies, including this rather familiar looking robot known as the Robot Samurai, I believe. From what I gather, judging from his early sketches, it seems like he contemplated giving it three legs. Indeed, it's quite reminiscent of the Kaheya tripods, but also of his own fighting machines, kind of like a combination of the two. The arms of his two machines are also similar, but in particular the attachment on the samurai closely resembles the heat ray utilised by his tripods. Indeed, he uses very rounded oval shapes to construct these fighting machines. Finally, a tripod that fits perfectly in my screen, which adds a distinctive egg-like nature to them. Hump try, dump try, hit like a ram. Hump try, dump try, then went kablam. As this illustration, which is kind of reminiscent of the 2005 film in some way, as this image shows, they even crack like an egg, and to me, they feel kind of fragile. You could probably make an egg holder based on them if you wanted to. I easily could have called this video the Egg Tripods. I was going to call it simply the E.P. Jacobs Tripods, but then I was like, you know, I really need to start coming up with more intriguing names. And then I realised, ah, oh, of course, the Tintin Tripods. And uh, judging by the reaction after I mentioned them, I think I gained a few XP that levelled up my marketing stat with that decision. It's just a shame that despite appearing in the same magazine, as Tintin, they don't actually cross over. Maybe that can be done one day. Tintin in the land of the Martians. Unlike the Kaheya tripods, where the cartoony eyes are the most criticised aspect of them, it kind of makes more sense in this context. Although it's worth pointing out that, unlike Kaheya, Jacobs doesn't entirely go down the cartoony route with the eyes. Despite what it looks like in a couple of the images, where they seem to be reflecting light. It's shown that the eyes are actually made out of the same material as the rest of the machine, which really differentiates it considerably from Kaheya's more than you'd expect on initial glance, and actually adds quite a bit of realism to them. You can actually almost imagine these eyes existing for real, which I find difficult to do with Kaheya's where it's more surrealistic. 
I say almost imagine though, because it is still kind of freaky trying to comprehend the fact that these eyes are metal, yet still seem to be used by the Martians to look around. The fact that these machines are made pretty much entirely out of this material gives them a very different feeling to most other adaptations I find. For some reason, they kind of reminded me of medieval knights, though I'm not entirely sure why. I guess especially with that sort of shark's fin on the back of their heads, which I presume is the tripod's fisherman's net that many adaptations either only show sometimes or forget to add entirely. This one incorporates it into the design very prominently, which is quite unique. Jacobs also prominently displays the tripods wielding their black smoke launchers and associated devices, again something which a lot of depictions miss entirely. I also really like not only how they use their many wire-like tentacles to grip them, but also the way these tentacles really do look like what the book describes, articulate ropes of steel dangling from it, emphasis on the articulate, many simple show them dangling, and indeed these really also emphasise the steel aspect of them, by which I mean how thick they are, to the point that they look like they can really do some damage. This is in contrast to Kaheya's drawings where I don't really feel like he actually ever gives these tentacles a purpose, they just seem to be there for aesthetic reasons. It's interesting seeing how different artists interpret the text, with Kaheya having the tripods hold the black smoke tubes with their arms, which in his case are themselves two much larger tentacles. One thing that I think is really fascinating to note about Jacob's many illustrations is how, to me, he captures so many different styles. He's got the cartooniness of Alvin Cahaya that you'd perhaps expect in a comic book, but many of his also capture the detail, I guess, or realism of the scenes he's depicting as well in a way that seems to have been inspired by Warwick Goebel's original drawings. When I recorded that I think you can tell I wasn't sure if realism was the right word to use then, but I've actually just found an analysis of these pictures by Hergé himself who seem to concur with this, writing, By the power of his fascinating realism, Edgar Jacobs provoked the same thrill as that which ran throughout America on the evening of a memorable Orson Welles broadcast, because it is a connection that can be made between artists who are both visionaries and technicians, with them nothing is left to chance. And just like Goebel, Jacobs frequently portrays buildings in sort of background silhouette. I love this one of Nelson's Column and the Palace of Westminster, which reveals how good he is at using silhouettes and depth to create such a stark image. Yet he also goes into such great clarity in other images, such as by showing Tower Bridge so clearly in much detail. Oh, and I just realised, Goebel's tripods were probably where Jacobs got the idea for the shark fin. Oh, and the rim in the middle of the body. Yeah, I guess the Jacobs tripods are actually like a combination of the Kaheya and Goebel ones. What's perhaps most impressive to me, however, is that Jacobs likewise captures the creepiness of Edward Gorey, who did perhaps one of the creepiest versions of the fighting machines. Yet in some of these images, I'd say Jacobs actually portrays the War of the Worlds in a way that's even creepier than Gorey would go on to do 14 years later. As Hergé said of Jacobs' work, they seem to me to perfectly convey the climate of anxious waiting, then panic from the novel. Compare Gorey's drawing of the heat ray coming out of the cylinder to E.P. Jacobs' version. Wow. This bizarrely is one of my favourite images in the Tintin magazine, almost certainly my favourite depiction of the heat ray coming out of the cylinder. Not only is it book text accurate, where it states a thin rod rose up joint by joint, bearing at its apex a circular disc, but Jacobs has portrayed this in such an ominous and creepy way, I absolutely love it. It somehow simultaneously combines the simplicity 
city of glory that makes it so insidious, with the detail of Gobel that heightens the horror, it's so brilliantly done, balanced to perfection, it's wonderful. Also, I like his red weed, which seems almost alive and snake-like in a threatening manner, as though it's about to attack, while also featuring spikes, meaning it's one of the only depictions I know of to reference the cactus-like description of the alien plant from the novel. By the way, if you find this kind of thing interesting, press the like button, as that tells YouTube to recommend you more of these kinds of videos. The power of the Martians is enhanced further by the way this massive explosion is caused by the beam of the heat ray, being portrayed as a simple thin white line, which is also, I'd say, an imaginative way of harkening back to the invisible nature of the heat ray described in the book, while still making it visible for the intended audience of the magazine. This particular image shows the advantage of the dark Kahaya eyes, it really allows different lighting to portray them in different ways, and when they're not ignited, they look so dark, empty, and soulless. Kind of reminds me of how the animatronics in Five Nights at Freddy's usually just have normal white eyes, but every so often, they're randomly seen with just pure shiny black eyes with a tiny white pupil. The ability to completely change the look of the eyes based on the lighting so creatively allows Jacobs to get the tone and feeling of the tripods he's after in any given image, although this picture also kind of looks like its eyes are just massively dilated. It's really enjoying its heat ray blowing up that cannon. The tentacles here particularly remind me of Gory's tripods, yet they seem far more deliberate, yet I guess clumsy is the word that comes to mind, and therefore dangerous, or imprecise I think is what I mean. Like how it feels the need to use so many tentacles wrapped so many times around the black smoke cannon to hold it. Yeah, it's deliberate, but imprecise. Another illustration that shows Jacob's skill at portraying horror is this one showing the tentacle poking through, investigating about, but unlike most artists, he actually shows the Martian's face through the crack, looking so insidious and evil. The composition of it is like a horror film poster or something. I don't know why this is, but it's curious how many, many artists seem to change the way they depict the Martian creatures multiple times throughout their work, and Jacobs is no exception. Perhaps the most notable and distinct image of his Martians is this one, which I don't really know what else to say about it other than it stands out massively. I've never seen any other quite like it, and it looks very insidious. Curious how it lacks pupils, where I think in pretty much every other image, they have them, which is odd because I think this is his idea of the Martians up close, in detail, whereas later on he's more depicting them in the kind of basic comic book style, such as this one here, where it looks kind of like an evil scheming cartoon spider, with what at first looks to be a happy smile, but of course that's actually the beak of the creature. And behind it we see one in the handling machine, he really takes on the crab-like description of them from the book, and it's also perhaps one of the most direct and least enigmatic depictions of the handling machines that I know of, which is pretty noteworthy, I guess, and it definitely, again, feels very cartoonish. Back to the tripods, though, I really love the cover shot of them in front of a, I guess, sunset above clouds of smoke. There's something elegant about them. As you know, I don't think that's the right word, majestic, perhaps. Yeah. The way they lift up their legs sort of reminds me of centaurs from Greek mythology. Although the biggest criticism I've seen of these tripods are that the legs wouldn't have worked properly because of how they're connected to the body on hinges. Now, I'm no engineer, so I could be wrong, but personally, I don't think there's really a problem in that respect, specifically because they are tripods. They would likely move in a sort of weird bobbing 
wobbly motion, perhaps, but they'd still be able to move, I'd imagine, with that back leg pushing while switching between the two other legs. I think this would actually be quite accurate, too, in portraying the tilted nature of their movement that is described in the text, which Jacobs, much like Warwick Goble, likewise replicates prominently. Also, I just had a thought, maybe it's possible that this middle rim section might be able to twist around. Maybe. Just a theory I had, but looking at the drawings and the positions of each leg, I don't think there's any that actually backs that up. What does seem evident, however, is that the bottom part of the legs are connected via a sort of ball joint, I think, that would give it slightly extra movement. This in particular is demonstrated in early sketches Jacobs did, showing how they would be able to move in a rotating motion from the looks of it. Also, I'm not sure if the head here was him experimenting with a smaller head, or if that's meant to be the Martian inside piloting it, but I noticed in the church image it looks to me like you can actually see the creature here too. Indeed, although people may criticise the logistical functionality of the leg, it seems unlikely this would be a mistake, as Edgar Jacobs was quite a perfectionist that would design prototypes and draw sketches of his vehicles beforehand, in order to have a good knowledge of their proportions so he could utilise them correctly perspective-wise. Speaking of which, I like this shot too from the window. It reminds me of those Gelato dev games I've played. It's also worth noting that his tripods were apparently designed with the advice of of an engineer of his friends. This all being said, I do think the legs are still very stiff and look as though they're man-made and terrestrial in origin, as opposed to being more living alien technology. I mean, in the Thunderchild illustration, you can practically see nuts and bolts coming loose from it. Hump try dump try saw a big ship. Hump try dump try exploded when hit. Talking about tripods getting defeated, let's take a look at Jacob's drawing that shows the end of the story, with the microscopic germs said to the tripods, All right, Pinhead, your time is up. Who are you calling Pinhead? Comparing this image to Goebbels' version, I'm even more convinced Jacobs took the most inspiration from the original artist. Even the dead Martians scattered about are very reminiscent of each other, and again, the creatures look relatively different to what they did previously. I really like just how many birds there are in this swarm flying in. Hump try dump try lay in a pit, hump try dump try to which birds flit, after all man's devices had failed to slay, putrefactive bacteria won us the day. Jacob's illustrations would be republished many times, reissued for our joy, as Hergé wrote in a preface for one of these instances. A reprint was even done as a hardcover album deluxe edition by Dargaul in 1986, limited to 700 numbered copies that apparently included a folding poster, showing how vital the illustrations were to these releases. Indeed, it's blatant to see why, what with E.P. Jacobs so expertly portraying even scenes of the story which I found are hardly ever depicted in such a very distinct way. It's no wonder me briefly mentioning and showing his tripods captivated so many people. 